So Jesus said, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. <clears throat> and that's the message of the gospel, is that we could be free from our sin. Because if we are not free of sin, that Bible says that we're enslaved to sin. <coughs> and what it means to be an enslaved to sin means that we cannot help but fall into sin. We cannot help but to sin. And so the beautiful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ said that I have come to set you free. And how is it that Jesus Christ has come to set us free? Jesus Christ has come to set us free by going to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins. There's no other way for us to be freed from our sin than Jesus Christ becoming enslaved on the cross. And that's what happened over 2,000 years ago. The beauty of Jesus Christ is that he went to the cross and he was nailed to the cross. And as he was nailed to the cross, he was enslaved to sin so that you and I could be free. And Jesus Christ came, he said, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And the, that's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that Jesus Christ says that I have come to set you free from sin. You see, as human beings, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that includes me and that includes you because every human being has broken God's law. And when we've broken God's law, we broke God's law because we have sinful natures in our hearts. <coughs> we were born with Adam's sin. And with Adam's sin, how you doing, lady? How are you? Good afternoon. What, who's, who's saying anything about, hey, I'm talking about being free from sin. And Jesus said, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And the way that Jesus makes us free is he was nailed to the cross. But we have to understand who it is that was nailed to the cross. The, the person that was nailed to the cross was none other than the second person of the Holy Trinity. <clears throat> you see, biblical Christianity believes in one God. <coughs> God is one being. But yet God has revealed himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's important for us to know and to understand because Jesus Christ as the Son of God, that's the only way that our sin can be taken away from us. <coughs> the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the beauty of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ knew no sin as the second person of the Holy Trinity. What happened? according to the Bible, is that God Himself became incarnate. That God Himself came in the flesh. That God Himself walked on the face of the earth. <coughs> and that's the greatest message that there is in all the history of the world. And, the, and Isaiah talks about this world has seen a great light. And the great light that we have seen is the light of Jesus Christ. In fact, He says, I am the light of the world. And tonight, I'm here to tell you that we can be freed from our sin. <laughs> we can be freed from our sin by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the way that Jesus Christ frees us from our sin is that Christ himself became enslaved to sin. But when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, what happened on the cross is that God the Father poured out the punishment <coughs> that sinners deserve. When you look at the cross over 2,000 years ago, what you see is God punishing Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so that Jesus Christ bore our sin. And that's what the message of the gospel, it is called the gospel because it is, it actually is good news. It's good news because God can and will free you from your sin, whatever that sin might be. And the way that God frees us from our sin is that over 2,000 years ago, God walked on the face of this earth incarnate in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. <coughs> and as fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ walked on the face of this earth as an innocent man. Jesus Christ never committed a sin. 
in all the time that he was here. He's not like us. How you doing, officer? Jesus Christ is not like us. Because when Jesus Christ was here on the earth, he never broke God's law. Jesus Christ kept God's law perfectly, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, the Bible defines sin as a violation or the breaking of God's law or the not keeping of God's law. You see, there's sins of omission and there's sins of commission. <clears throat> and every one of us have sinned. You see, we're not sinners because we did sinful things. We did sinful things because we're sinners in our hearts. And unless the Lord God Almighty takes and changes our heart, our human heart, we remain dead in our trespasses and our sin. That's the beauty of the gospel, that we as human beings, when we're born into this world, we're born as sinners. We have hearts in Ezekiel chapter 36. It talks about that the Spirit of God will take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And what that means that we have hearts of stone, it just is reiterating what God said in the Garden of Eden when he said to Adam, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day you will surely die. <clears throat> and what happened on the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you could see that they did not immediately die. How you doing, sir? How are you? You can see that they did not immediately die, but we do see that they physically, they spiritually died. And so in their hearts, they became sinners. And so from that time forward, all the children of Adam and Eve, <coughs> from that time forward, had sinful hearts. And so the, it's our sinful actions come out of our sinful hearts. You see, unless God does a supernatural work, in our human hearts, we will remain in our sins and our trespasses for all eternity. But you see, God is a holy God. And because God is holy, that means He cannot and will not tolerate any sin in His presence. That's what it means in 1 John when it says that God is light and in Him is no darkness whatsoever. <clears throat> when God said that He is light, that means that there's no sin in God. And in Isaiah chapter 30, um, chapter 6, it says God is holy. God is holy, holy, holy. And what that means is that God is completely other, completely different than us human beings. <coughs> because you see, we as human beings are not holy beings. We're sinful beings. The Bible says that the human heart is desperately wicked. And all that it says, it says in Isaiah chapter 53, for all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all gone to our own way. That's the nature of human hearts. But you see the message of the gospel, the message of the gospel is not that God takes and makes bad people good. The message of the gospel is that God takes dead people and he makes them alive. You see, even though we're physically alive, we're spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead. And if we do not have a supernatural work of the Spirit of God upon our hearts, we'll remain dead in our trespasses and sin for all eternity. And that's what Paul was talking about in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, <coughs> where he writes to the people in Ephesus, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Think about that. That's where we all are. You see, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live. Because even though you are physically alive and I'm physically alive, we're spiritually dead to God. We have hearts of stone is the way that the Bible uh, describes it. And the Bible describes that we are enslaved to sin. You see, apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot help but sinning. And that's where people are at right now. We, we celebrate sin because we cannot overcome it. <coughs> we try to redefine sin, but we don't have the right and the power to rewrite the Bible. We don't have the right to rewrite what God has said in His Word. And God has been very clear 
to define sin as a violation of His law, and His law is a reflection of His holy character. So the God that made heaven and earth, this is the God that made you, that made this place, that made everything here in the world. And originally the world was not as it is now. The world became fallen, the world became corrupt, the world became twisted because Adam sinned against God. When Adam sinned against God, <coughs> when Adam sinned against God, he defied God and all the universe, all, every cell, every molecule of the universe was affected by Adam's sin. And so that's why we see death. That's why we see destruction. That's why we see disease. That's why people are dying. That's why we have funeral homes in this world. We have funeral homes in this world because of Adam's sin. And the Bible tells us that we are under the first Adam unless we turn from our sin and become part of the second Adam. And the only way that we can become part of the second Adam is for us to put our faith and our, and our hope in Jesus Christ. And the Bible de de describes Jesus as the second Adam. And what that means is that Jesus Christ is the representative of all those who believe in Him. While in the first Adam all died... How you doing, brother? Thank you. I appreciate it. While in the first Adam all people died physically and spiritually, that's why we have death in this world. But you see, Jesus Christ has come to give us life. And that's why the Bible says that you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. And he's talking to Christians here. You see, Christians were dead in their transgressions and sins. And I'm sorry to hurt your feelings, but the Bible is very clear that if you are not in Christ Jesus, you are still dead in your trespasses and your sins. You may be physically alive, but spiritually speaking, <coughs> you are dead. You're dead and you cannot do anything but sin. And some people wonder if we have free choice. We certainly do have free choice, but a sinner can only do one thing in their free choice, and that is to choose sin. That is to break God's law, because it's out of the heart, it's out of the sinful heart that God Almighty sees what we are made of and what we're capable of. And it doesn't take long to look at humanity, look at how awful humanity is. All you have to do is take a look in history. You could go back, how far do you want to go back? You could go back to the Aztecs. I mean, the Aztecs used to practice human sacrifices, so did the Mayans. You could go back to Cortez and what he did in Mexico. You could go back to um, the Soviet Union with um, Joseph Stalin and what he did. <coughs> Over 60 million people died under his regime. That's the result of the human heart that must be changed. And that's why Hitler in Nazi Germany killed not just six million Jews, but over 40 million people. The reason Adolf Hitler did that is because he was a sinful man and he rejected the one and only true Trinitarian God who revealed himself in the pages of his self-authenticating scriptures. And so the only way that we can be saved is the work, a supernatural work, of God upon our hearts. That's why all through the Bible, the Bible, many people have not read the Bible, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible is all about. <clears throat> the Bible is all about the story of how God has sought out sinful humanity. If you look in Genesis chapter 3, <laughs> expose your child to new ideas, and let them make up their own mind. Isn't that what it's supposed to be all about? Because in Genesis chapter 3, it's after Adam's sin, it was God himself that went looking for Adam and Eve. Because Adam could not save himself. Adam and Eve were hiding, were hiding from God. And they were covering themselves with an apron, with leaves. <coughs> and it was God who sought them out. And that's the story of the Bible. The Bible over and over again comes and tells us how God comes and he seeks us out just like in the Garden of Eden. It's a supernatural work of God. If we were left to ourselves, if we were left to ourselves, we would die 
for all eternity. But that's what grace is all about. You know that song, Amazing Grace? Many of you don't, e don't even know who sang that song. That song was sung by a man named John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader. He lamented for all his life that he participated in the enslavement of human beings. <coughs> but you see, when God got a hold of John Newton's heart, he could not help but write the, the words of the hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see, John Newton knew that he was a sinner that needed to be redeemed by God. And it was only because of the supernatural work of God upon his heart that John Newton was able to call Jesus Christ Lord. <coughs> and that's the message of who Jesus Christ is. The message of Jesus Christ is that God has come into this world. That God has come into this world as a tiny baby in Bethlehem. God has come into this world. That's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says in, in John chapter 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what that is talking about is how God himself, through the incarnation, it was God again coming to us. It was again, again an act of God's grace upon us. It is always through the Bible. You see, most people, they give their opinion about the Bible, but they've never read it. The Bible is a book of love. It's a book of the love of God coming to sinful humanity. And that if he left us in our sins and our trespasses, we would perish for all eternity. We would die for all eternity. But the Bible shows us how God from the beginning of with Adam and Eve went looking for them and said, where are you, Adam? We see God going to Abraham <coughs> and calling Abraham to be his son, to be a father of many nations. We see God coming to Noah and telling him to build an ark in order to save a portion of humanity. And that we see God going through Joseph and he went through all those horrible things in his life because God said that he came to the sinful humanity. And that's what happened in the, the gospel. It's that God himself has come into this world. <coughs> and that's why God sent Moses to Pharaoh. That's the only way that he could save Israel from enslavement was the work, a supernatural work of God. You see, because if God did not do a supernatural work, then Israel would still be enslaved. In fact, people of Israel still to this day celebrate how God freed them from, from sin. How y'all doing? That's what the message of the Bible is. It's that God is the one that does the supernatural work for us in salvation. <clears throat> And so even Israel would be still enslaved in Egypt if God did not do the supernatural work that he did. And God sought out Israel through Saul and he sought out Israel through David. And God sought out through the prophets, Israel through the prophets. And that's why we have Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hezekiah and Habakkuk. <clears throat> All these men were sent to sinful Israel to tell them about the love of God. <coughs> and some people may say it's not a message of love, but if you are enslaved to something, if you are headed to an eternity of hell, how loving would it be for me to ignore you? How loving would it be for me to just say nothing? That would be the most horrific thing. That would be an act of hate to not say to you the message of the gospel. You see, the ultimate message of the gospel of God seeking us out is in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. How you doing? Good, good. See, Jesus Christ is where God came into this world. And that's why it says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. You see, the love of God has been shown to us. The love of God has been manifest to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There it is again. The love of God 
that has been poured out upon humanity that hates God. <coughs> but you see, it's a supernatural work that God must do upon your heart to take away your heart of flesh and give you, uh, take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You see, and that's what the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so I'm out here in hopes that the Spirit of God will use the preaching of His Word that will fall upon your dead and your stony heart and that God will regenerate you and show you the way of Jesus Christ, the way that your sins can and will be forgiven. You see, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, that's why it says God commended, hey brother, how you doing? God commended His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, that's how much God loves us. You see, the message of the gospel is a message of love. How you doing? No, I'm preaching the gospel. Yeah, I mean, the Bible. I mean, that's not the only sin. And, and you know, sometimes people would just focus on, you know, homosexuality. But, you know, lying is a sin, all these things. Yeah, in a way, I mean, it's a public event. And they, they kind of push it on everybody. So I'm here preaching, and maybe, maybe I can change one of their hearts. Yeah, what's your name? Cameron, I'm Norman. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming over and asking. Yeah, yeah you too. God bless you. <coughs> and that's what the message of the gospel is. The message of the gospel is the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts, that we no longer have to remain slaves to sin. You see, and sinners do not like to hear the message of the gospel. You know why? Because we love our sin. But the problem with sin is that sin eventually will pull you down to hell. Sin will eventually destroy your life. There's nothing good in sin. I mean, the, 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 um, the interesting thing about sin is that initially it feels very good. There's a lot of pleasure when we sin. You know, if you steal something from the store, it feels good if you don't get caught. <clears throat> if you uh, lust after somebody or you commit adultery or you sexually sin, it feels good for a time. You know, it feels good to kind of get your emotions out and use the name of the Lord in vain. Sometimes it feels good in order to tell off your mom and your dad or to do whatever you want on the Sabbath. <coughs> Initially, sin actually does feel good and it's completely understandable why we would want to sin but you saw there's a law the law is called the law of diminishing returns and you all know what i'm talking about the law of diminishing returns is that initially when you sin it feels really good and you, you get a high from it but over time as you continue in sin it takes more and more in order to get the same kick you once did from the old sin. And so at first, we start out with a small sin and it feels good, we get away with it. But then now over time, it takes more and more and more in order for us to be satisfied. <coughs> and what eventually happens is, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so ultimately speaking, the law of diminishing returns is initially sin feels good, it feels great to be able to get away from it, but the longer you remain in sin, eventually what will happen is you'll end up in death. How you doing, sir? You're doing all right. I don't want any money. I really don't. Yeah, no, thank you so much, but I appreciate it. <coughs> so sin feels good, and right now, <coughs> you feel good, you feel young, you feel healthy, it feels all so good, but eventually, over time, what happens? It's like the man who just takes a sip of alcohol and it feels so good. He takes a gulp of alcohol, it feels better. And then he gets drunk, and before you know it, he's walking around, he's drinking whole bottles of alcohol. And after a while, his tolerance builds. And over time, he becomes addicted to alcohol. And it takes more and more alcohol in order to satisfy the thirst for it. <clears throat> and this is a story that happens over and over again for many people. <coughs> and before you know it, you stop showing up to work, you start doing things that you would never do because alcohol 
is kind of like a social lubricant. It takes down our defenses, and that's why many people often drink in order to sin. But over time, I've seen men, I, my own grandfather was an alcoholic, and over time, at first, when he was a young man, it felt good for him to drink. But over time, by time I saw my grandfather for the last time, he was only 76 years old. And I saw him in a funeral home in a body bag. My grandfather drank himself to death because the wages of sin is death. And I feel bad for my grandfather because he never came to know Jesus Christ who can set you free from your sin. You see, Christ could have set my grandfather free from the sin of alcohol, but instead my grandfather loved alcohol more than he loved his wife. My grandfather loved alcohol more than he loved to work. My grandfather loved alcohol more than he loved his family. My grandfather loved alcohol more than he loved life himself. And so finally, at the end of his life, he gave away his life to alcohol. <coughs> you see, because the wages of sin is death, and you don't feel it right away, but over time you will feel it. You feel it now. And that's why that guilty feeling that you have, you, you try to hide that. I mean, modern psychology, Sigmund Freud, do you know what Sigmund Freud's philosophy of psychology is? That you would go to therapy so that you would no longer feel guilty for sin. And so people would get psychotherapy in the Freudian tradition. And one of the things that psychotherapy tried to do in the Freudian tradition was try to make people feel okay about their sin. But Sigmund Freud lied to people. That sense of guilt that we have as human beings is a check that the Spirit of God has put upon your heart in order to save you. So when you feel guilty when you were a child and you stole something and you felt guilty, or you disobeyed your parents and you felt guilty, that was a good thing. Guilt is a good thing that God has given us in our lives and in our hearts. <clears throat> and so humanity, what we do is we try to suppress that feeling of guilt. And that's why people like me, people don't like it when you go out preaching because we make you feel guilty. And nobody wants to feel guilty. We're trying to suppress that feeling of guilt. But I can tell you tonight, I am affirming for you tonight, if you have sinned before God, let that feeling of guilt, let, let, it, let it grip a hold of your heart. Let the tears flow. Feel bad about the things that you've done feel bad about your sin but you see the Bible is not just about the fact that we're supposed to feel bad about our sin you see repentance is not just sorrow over our sin <clears throat> anybody feels bad the next morning but the Bible tells us to repent you see repent is a word in Greek that is metanoia and metanoia means to turn from your wicked ways that you were once traveling in one way and you decided to travel another way but you see you cannot repent of your own sin until God himself does a work in your life does a supernatural work in your life because other than that you will not feel guilty of your sin so praise the Lord for the feeling of guilt but guilt is not going to save you guilt is supposed to drive us to the foot of the cross it's supposed to drive us to Jesus Christ why Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And Jesus Christ has come to show us the Father. As it says in John chapter 1, let me turn to that. In John chapter 1, <clears throat> it says that Jesus Christ, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> it says in verse 14 in, in Gospel of John in the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has been ahead of me, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we all have received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in verse 18 particularly verse 18 
in the Gospel of John says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. You see, Jesus Christ is the one that has revealed God the Father to us. So if you ever wonder what Jesus Christ, what, what uh, God is like, if you've ever wondered, all you need to do is take a look at Jesus Christ. Read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in there you see the words of Jesus. You see the character of Jesus because Jesus Christ is explaining God the Father. And God the Father is a God of love. And God the Father has loved us so much that He gave. He gave His only begotten Son. And that's who Jesus Christ is. He is the only begotten Son of God. You see, biblical Christianity believes in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God the Father has ordained for us to be saved, for God the Son to come into this world. And when God the Son came into this world, God the Son came into this world to be innocent before God, to keep the law of God, to, to show us the love of God. And at the end of his life, after Jesus Christ kept the law of God absolutely and perfectly, at the end of his life, then Jesus Christ went voluntarily to the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the central most important event in all of humanity because on the cross of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, who is fully God and who is fully man, died on the cross. And when Christ went to the cross, Jesus Christ went to the cross as an innocent man, full of love, full of love of the Father. Some people say that God is a heavenly child abuser, but nothing could be further from the truth. You see, Jesus Christ went to the cross in obedience to the Father, but there's something very powerful that happened on the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went to the cross, <clears throat> what happened there is that God the Father punished Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners. You see, the only person in all of history that has not deserved to be punished for sin, it's Jesus Christ. <coughs> Jesus Christ is the only one in all of history that has never sinned before God as a representative of humanity. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, the beauty of Jesus Christ is when he was on the cross, he was completely innocent of any sin. And I've said this before in other times and other places, even the civil magistrate, even the judge of Rome washed his hands of Jesus and he said, I find no guilt in this man. And they had a bunch of false accusers trying to come against Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ did not deserve to be punished for any sin because he was completely innocent, both in his heart and in his actions and his hands. And so when Jesus Christ went to the cross, this is the only way that God could forgive us of our sins. The only way that God could forgive us of our sins is to make Jesus Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a beautiful and powerful verse because Jesus Christ went to the cross and what happened on the cross is that Jesus Christ died in our place, died in the place of all of those who believe in Him and trust in Him. And so when Jesus Christ was innocent upon the cross, God the Father punished Jesus Christ the Son for all the sinners of he, those whom God has intended to save. <coughs> so Christ the righteous, Christ the innocent, became guilty on the cross. And on the cross, that's where God the Father punished Jesus Christ the Son. Jesus God the Father poured out His wrath, His anger that I deserve, that all sinners deserve, that every person that God has intended to save. That's what God did on the cross. He punished Jesus Christ in my place and in the place of everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's what was happening on the cross that day. On the cross, Jesus Christ took my sin 
and God the Father punished Jesus Christ with the punishment that I deserved. You see, if I was left to myself, I would go to hell. If I was left to myself, I'm a man of sin. If I was left to myself, I would just continually sin before God. I would be a horrible, wicked man. But it's not until God got a hold of my heart, it was an act of God's grace that he came to me and he filled my heart with holiness and righteousness. That's what happened on the cross. God took away my sin and he punished Jesus Christ on the cross for my sin. You see, it was my sin that put Jesus Christ there on the cross. And it was the sin of all those that God intended to save. And what we see on the cross for those six hours, what we see on the cross for those six hours is the wrath of God towards sin. We can see what sin actually deserves when you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Sin actually deserves the wrath of God, the punishment of God. And so six hours Jesus Christ hung on the cross. Six hours he was mocked by people. He was spit upon people. And when he was hanging on the cross, his blood dripped from his hands and from his feet and from his beard because they pulled out his beard. His hair was caked with blood and spit because people spit upon Jesus Christ. Think about it. Here is the only good man that has ever existed in all of humanity. The only good person that has ever existed in all humanity. And look what we did to him. Was it the, the Jews that crucified Christ? Yes. Was it the Romans that crucified Christ? Yes. Was it the Roman Empire? Yes. But it was me too and all of those who are forgiven in Jesus Christ. But only ultimately speaking, <coughs> Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, it was God the Father that punished Jesus Christ on the cross. It was God the Father that ordained Jesus Christ to go to the cross. So ultimately, the one who crucified Jesus Christ was the one and only true God the Father who has revealed himself in the Bible. And why did God do this? God did this because there's no other way of salvation. There's no other way to have our sins taken away. You see, God just doesn't overlook our sin. God has to, for, has to punish our sin. And so someday when we stand before God, you will either stand as a person who has been forgiven of your sin by the blood of Jesus Christ and the punishment of Jesus Christ. And if you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, God promises, God made a covenant with himself. The covenant that God made with himself is that all who believe in and trust in the vicarious sacrificial death of Jesus Christ would be forgiven of their sin. <coughs> you see, what a message of hope there is that all the guilty stain of your sin, your stony heart could be taken away and God will give you a heart of flesh, a heart that can respond to Him. But you see, until the Spirit of God does that supernatural work of, of the Holy Spirit upon your dead heart, there's nothing that you could do. But I pray this evening as I preach the Word of God that God will take away that heart of sin, that heart of stone, that heart that hates Him, and that God will give you a heart of flesh, a, God, a heart that's alive, a heart that's filled with love towards God. And when God does that, that's the grace of God. It is the unmerited favor and the unmerited gift that God gives us. That's what the song Amazing Grace is all about. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found. That's the message of the gospel. <clears throat> because God himself, unless he took away my heart of stone. Unless God took away my heart of sin, I would remain in sin for all eternity. And someday, when I die, and I will die, and so will you, so will you, someday we will stand before God. We will stand before God as our judge and as our maker. And when you stand before God, you will either be proclaimed innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ, or God will say to you, depart from me, for I never knew you. Depart from me, you wicked ones. You see, Jesus Christ 
also talked about the sheep and the goats. Most people don't know this. Most people don't read their Bibles. Jesus Christ actually talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Most people don't realize that because they have not actually taken time to read the Bible. But Jesus Christ talked about how at the end of the age, God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats are those who God will cast into hell forever. <clears throat> and again, I say this often, this is not a message that you hear from your happy clappy churches. I doubt that you'll hear this message from the first church here in Hartford. You're not gonna hear it from other churches in Hartford because they don't wanna hurt your feelings. You see, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, while it's good news, it does hurt people's feelings. It hurts people's feelings because we have to come to an, an understanding, <coughs> an acknowledgement that we have sinned before God. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, have to, I think that this is about my favorite verse of the Bible. You see, because Jesus Christ has died on the cross for us, all we must do is confess our sins to Jesus Christ, to trust in Jesus Christ alone, trust in his vicarious sacrificial death upon the cross. And as you trust in the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross, God the Father promises that he will do something amazing for you. He will look upon Jesus Christ as the sinner and he will look upon you as a righteous man. He will look upon you as his son. You see, biblical Christianity talks about justification. Justification is the doctrine that God pardons us from all our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a term of justice. To be justified is to be proclaimed <clears throat> innocent while you once were guilty. <coughs> And so it's through Jesus Christ that we are justified from our sin. It is through Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. And so when we are justified, when we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, God the Father forgives us of our sin through the act of Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the, sin, the, the, the uh, shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. And so God takes away our sin. He pardons our sin. And so if we confess our sins, it says in 1 John, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins. And so the message that I have for you this evening is that you could be forgiven of your sin by having faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ to trust in Him alone for your salvation. And when you trust in Him, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took away your sin upon the cross. But that's not all that this verse talks about. This verse also talks about if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. But there's another part of the verse. And the other part of the verse is that God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, biblical Christianity is not just about the forgiveness of sins, it's also about the cleansing from sin. You see, I started out talking about this a while ago, that Jesus said that I have come to set you free from sin. But the only way that God can forgive us and set us free from sin is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But biblical Christianity is not just about forgiveness of sins, it's also about the cleansing from all unrighteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is here with us right now. Jesus Christ said, I need to go away. The reason He need to go away is so that His Spirit would come into this world. And so that's what Christians talk about when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Again, biblical Christians believe in one God. We are monotheistic, but we believe in the three persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God is with us right now, the Spirit of Christ. Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven and He sits at the right hand 
of God the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. But when Jesus Christ went away and sits at the right hand of God the Father, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that the human heart can be changed, can be changed from sin, can be changed from guilt. It's the Spirit of God that works upon us, that He effectually applies the work of Jesus Christ into our lives and into our hearts. It's the effectual calling of God through the preaching of His Word. <coughs> so I don't know who's going to be saved because of my preaching, maybe nobody. But the Bible commands people who believe in Jesus Christ to go into the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm very sad that I'm the only Christian in West Hartford, I'm the only Christian around that has enough faith and belief and has enough love for people. Enough love for people to tell them about the love of God that was shown to us in Jesus Christ. Where are the Christians? No wonder people don't want to listen to Christians anymore. Because Christians are hiding behind their four walls of their churches and pastors have grown fat and lazy. They don't care about people anymore because if they did care about people, they would come out into the streets and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible commands us. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the only way that you can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ is for somebody to come and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to tell you about the love that God has for us through Jesus Christ on the cross. And so that's what we're doing here tonight. That's what I'm doing here tonight. I'm here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to tell people that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And what are we being saved from? We're being saved from the wrath of God. We're being saved from God's punishment for sin. You see, Jesus Christ said in the Garden of Gethsemane, take this cup from me. Do you know what that cup was that Jesus wanted so much to have taken away from him? It was the cup of God's wrath. You see, we all deserve God's wrath. We are under God's wrath. And unless we come to Jesus Christ as our only Lord and our Savior, we remain under the wrath of God. You see, the Bible does not say that everybody is a child of God. You see, because every human being, apart from Jesus Christ, we hate God. We don't want anything to do with God Almighty. We reject Him. We want nothing to do with the one and only true God who has revealed Himself in the pages of the Bible. That's the condition of the human heart. And so today, as I preach the Word of God, I pray that the Spirit of God would move upon your heart and that you would hear the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, that in Christ your sins can be forgiven. It is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus Christ that ran down His body from His hands and from his feet and from his beard because they pulled out his beard and they pulled out his hair and they put a crown of thorns on him and they mocked him and they called him names <clears throat> and Jesus Christ did all of that he did all of that and he went to the cross and he took the punishment of God the Father upon himself so that all those who believe in him will not perish that's what John 3.16 is all about. John 3.16, <coughs> pardon me. John 3.16 says, and this is probably the most known verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, that's what the Bible's all about for God the one and only true God, because there's only one, one and only true God. And this God of the Bible says this, for God so loved the world. You see, the love of God has been manifest to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world. You see, the world left to itself is a world that's in sin 
The world left to itself is headed for hell. The world left to itself is Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Pol Pot and all the rest of the tyrants. You see, but God so loved the world, the one and only true Trinitarian God who has revealed himself in the pages of the Bible. This is the God who is love. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. And God has shown us his love. And in John 3.16, it says, <coughs> For God so loved the world. You see, the love of God can be seen. The love of God is tangible. The love of God is just not a theory. The love of God is actually a person. For God so loved the world that he gave. The word gave there means that God sacrificed. And many people pass over that word. For God so loved the world that he gave. And when the Bible says that God gave, what God gave us was his son, his only begotten son, that all who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what the message of the gospel is. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the son of God and the son of man. And that's what God gave us. He gave us his only son to die in our place for our sin so that our sin was taken away and you need to hear this sir you need to hear the message of the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that your sins can and will be taken away sir there's no other way and you walk in sin until you give your life to Christ and that's the love of <coughs> the love of God that has been poured out upon us <coughs> And that's why the Bible is so clear. For God so loved the world. It was an act of love that God had for us that he gave his only begotten son. In the giving of Jesus Christ, that word gave, it's a, it's a bloody word. And the re reason it's a bloody word is because when God gave his son, Jesus Christ went to the cross to bear the sin of sinners, to take the punishment that I deserve, that you deserve. If you put your faith and your hope in Him. That's where the love of God is manifested to us. You see, biblical Christianity is a, is a faith of love. It's a, it's a calling of God the Father, God Almighty, coming into this world. God could have left us to ourselves, but God did not leave us to ourselves. Just like in the Garden of Eden, when Adam had sinned against God and was hiding from God, and God went looking for him and said, Adam, where are you? And that's what God does for us because of his love. He keeps looking for us and calling to us and showing us and revealing Jesus Christ to us. How are you doing? Love and peace to you too. You're welcome. <clears throat> and so that's what the biblical Christianity is all about. It's all about the love of God that has been shown to us in Jesus Christ, his son. And when Jesus Christ, his son, went to the cross, Jesus Christ bore the sin. I don't want your money. I don't want your money. I don't want your money. No, I don't want your love. I don't want your money. Yeah, well, if, as long as it's good, godly Christian love, I'll take that. <laughs> Are you Christian? Do you know Jesus Christ, sir? You do. I'm glad. I'm glad you did that. Trust in him alone for salvation. And so that's what the Bible's all about, is the love of God that has been revealed to us. You see, if God did not do a supernatural act of love for us, if God did not give us his son, then we would be lost in our sins. How are you doing this evening? Oh, no, thank you. No, I know, but you, you, you obviously, what's that? No, I was just preaching about the love of God through Christ. Yeah, you too, you too. And so there's no need to hate me either, right? Yeah, amen, I, I, amen to that, amen. <clears throat> And so that's what God does, is that He, through Jesus Christ, has forgiven us of our sins as you trust in Christ alone for your salvation. And so that's what I'm out here. People are saying, why are you preaching hate? I've said the word love so many times. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the love of God that has been manifest to us. In fact, it says in the book of Romans, God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
<clears throat> That's a powerful message of love, that if God left us to ourselves, if God left humanity to ourselves, what we would have is a world full of Joseph Stalin's, a world full of Adolf Hitler's. But because God loves us, because God sought us out, because God gave us Jesus Christ, he showed us the way of salvation. And the way of salvation is Jesus Christ going to the cross willingly. And it's upon the cross of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ took our sin upon him. Jesus Christ was punished on our behalf. And when you cr trust in Jesus Christ alone, that means that God will look upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ rather than yourself. The only way that we could be forgiven. The Bible says that the, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away our sin. There's only one way for our sin to be taken away, and that is for Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the Son of God and the Son of Man, to go upon the cross and be punished on our behalf. And when Jesus Christ was punished on our behalf, there's a beautiful exchange. That's what the verse says, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. You see, Jesus Christ became sin on our behalf. It's a beautiful thing that God has done for us. That Jesus Christ took our sin upon him when we have faith in him. And when Jesus Christ hung upon the cross that day 2,000 years ago, what was happening is was that God was punishing, the, taking, he was pouring out the sin that I deserve and that you deserve upon his son, Jesus Christ. And on the cross, Jesus Christ, who was innocent. And that's what it means. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And what the Bible teaches is that Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man, was completely innocent in this world. Jesus Christ never sinned. And when he went to the cross, he went to the cross as an innocent man so that our sins could be taken away. You see, Jesus Christ shows us the love of God. Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin became sin in our behalf. And how beautiful that is, that Jesus Christ, the righteous, Jesus Christ, who is innocent, Jesus Christ, who had never sinned before, Jesus Christ, who had never sinned before, went to the cross and he took the punishment that I deserve and that you deserve. And so he who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, had never sinned before God whatsoever. When he hung on the cross, Jesus Christ was an innocent man. And so God the Father punished Jesus Christ, the innocent one, for us guilty ones. And that's why the Bible says that God made him who knew no sin to be sinned on our behalf. And that's the exchange that Jesus Christ took away our sin on the cross. He took away our punishment on the cross. And the verse continues, so that we might be the righteousness of God. How you doing, ladies? Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, I do. Thank you, I have Christ in my heart. And you too? You trust in Christ? You see, that's what the message of the gospel is. <coughs> that's what the message of the gospel is. The message of the gospel. See, the message of the gospel is Jesus Christ taking our sin away because on the cross Jesus Christ the Son of God and the Son of Man took away our sin and because of that we have forgiveness of our sins that's what the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God and on the cross there's an exchange that happens for all those who trust in Jesus Christ the exchange that happens is when you put your faith in Christ, God the Father puts and punished Jesus Christ the Son on our behalf. And then what happens is, is that God gives us the righteousness and holiness of Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of the gospel, is that God takes away our sin and puts it upon and punishes Jesus Christ. And then he gives us the holiness of Jesus Christ. And in the eyes of God, we stand before him when we are in Christ. We stand before him as innocent 
and forgiven. How are you doing? God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I definitely am going to need it. You're exactly right. I 100% do need it. That's why I call upon the name of Christ, that he would have mercy upon me. <clears throat> I do need, he's right. He's right. I do need the work of God. I do need the uh, supernatural touch of the Spirit of God upon my heart. Because if I, left to myself, I have no righteousness in and of myself. I have nothing in myself that would ever merit any kind of forgiveness or holiness or whatsoever. It must be, it must be a supernatural work of God upon our hearts. And that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the message of love that God has for the world, that he gave his only begotten son. How you doing? God bless you. I'm glad. God bless you. Amen. That's what I was saying. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. <coughs> so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate your support. I appreciate the kindness of I appreciate the kindness of people um, walking by. Um, I was also respectful came over here instead of in the midst of them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll be at other Pride events um, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Officers, just so you know, I'll be at other Pride events um, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling sinners to repentance. So you might as well get used to me and um, I will continue to preach that gospel that comes only through the love of Jesus Christ. The message that only comes from Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins that only comes from Jesus Christ. I just love saying his name because Jesus Christ died on, our, on my behalf. Jesus Christ took away my sin. Jesus Christ took away the punishment that my sin deserved. And I thank him for that because if it was left to myself, if it was left to myself, I would perish in my trespasses and sins. And that's why it says, in the book of Ephesians it says in the book of Ephesians that you were dead in your trespasses and sins you see when you're in Christ you're no longer dead in your trespasses and your sins when you're in Christ Jesus you have been forgiven of all your sin as if they've never existed and then the Spirit of God fills your body you see the Bible says in in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 I think it's verse 19 <laughs> let me look it up <laughs> Pardon me. No. Um. Gosh. No, I, I should be able to quote this verse, but my mind is going blank. Uh, but it talks about how our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the only way that we could be temples of the Holy Spirit is for the Spirit of God to come into our lives. The only way the Spirit of God could possibly come into our bodies is our bodies have to be proclaimed as clean and righteous and holy. And the only way our bodies can be proclaimed as clean and righteous and holy is by the blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray that you will find forgiveness of your sins. Good evening. <laughs>